In this segment, we're going to talk about AC modeling. So we talked about how the AC interferes with or interference effects from AC transmission towers parallel to pipelines, how that impacts the pipeline, three different modes of impact. Now we're going to talk about modeling. So just as a recap, three different issues, step and touch potentials. We want to below, be below 15 volts AC. We've got conductive couplings where there's a fault condition, it dumps current into the earth. We want to make sure that the pipeline is not going to be damaged by that dumping of current in the earth. And then there's induced voltage. This is the voltage that's induced on the pipeline because it runs parallel to it, is in the field around this transmission line and is picking up voltage, is picking up induced current. And how do we deal with that on the pipeline? So in this segment, we're going to talk about modeling and design. In some instances, we can do a best guess mitigation approach, okay? In some instances, it's just not worth the effort to put this all into a model to try to figure out what the impact's gonna be. I've got a simple co-location, it's one mile, the right away comes in, I run parallel to the high voltage line, and then I leave. It's one mile, it's relatively simple, I've gone out in the field and I've measured that I'm picking up AC, and I'm just gonna put grounding in from A to B and be done with it. It's over design, but the cost of modeling would exceed the cost of just going and fixing it. And if you've got some experience in this in this field, you can kind of say it's going to look like if I do this, this, and this, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to get everything I need to get. Okay. Now when we get into more complex pipeline arrangements, multiple pipelines in the same corridor, multiple HVAC lines coming in and out, because often it's not just one HVAC tower, it might be multiple towers, or the tower may have, instead of just one circuit, it may have two or three circuits on there. Okay. When it gets to be more complex, you just can't go and throw grounding in the earth and hope it's going to work. Because you may ground it over here and it may just push the current over here. Okay, so then we start to go into modeling. Modeling is data intensive. Okay, just like any type of modeling where we're going to use a computer to predict what's going on, the quality of the data we give the computer model impacts the quality of the results we're going to get. Okay, at Macro we use a program called um, Right Away Pro. It's a software package developed by a company called Safe Engineering um, Services and Technology. They're out of Canada. This is probably the leading modeling package um, out there uh, on the planet today. There are some other modeling softwares out there um, that are less expensive and less um, accurate. But the SES software is kind of the gold standard for modeling software. Um, so that's what we use when we do AC modeling. And this is a service that Macor provides. Okay, we have. Um, trained uh, professionals who have years of experience modeling AC um, systems in the pipeline industry that are operating this software, which is a very complex software. The goals when you do AC modeling are simple. We want to calculate fault condition stress values. During a fault condition, what's the worst fault condition that can occur? And we look at it each individual tower where the faults could occur. We say, what's the worst that can happen at this tower, and how does that affect the pipeline, given the relationship of the pipeline to that tower, how far away it is, how deep it is, what the resistance is at that location, and we literally model every one of the towers along the length of that co-location, and maybe one past it. So that's the fault conditions. That's a separate model from the other models. We then do an induced voltage calculation. That's that impact of having the electrical field and the pipeline running through it and picking up voltage. And we model that for, for every co-location. Um, again, it can get rather complex when you've got multiple pipelines in the same corridor, when you've got multiple AC AC towers in the same corridor, and the software, you have to model all that and then you run it. And sometimes it takes days, literally, for it to compile and run all of the calculations it needs to do to come up with the result. So you can build the model and then you have to let it run and it actually takes sometimes take up several days to run the model. We want to predict the AC current density along the length of the pipeline. Okay. We talked about AC induced corrosion being a function of how much current is being discharged off small holidays. And there's a certain threshold we don't want to exceed or we can be concerned about corrosion occurring. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to say, okay, if this is the model of the pipeline, this is where it's picking up current at every point along that pipeline, should we be concerned if there, because we don't know where the holidays in the coding are. We can't predict where the holidays in the coding are. They're just distributed randomly. But at every spot, if there were a holiday of this size, would we have a problem? 
And that will change depending on where we are along that pipeline in the co-location and also what the soil resistance is around the pipeline in that location. Lower soil resistivities tend to mean higher current discharge. So those tend to be the areas of concern. And then we're going to evaluate mitigation measures. Where should we put mitigation, how much mitigation, and how effective will it be? And as we're calculating that induced voltage over the length of the pipeline, we're looking for areas where we exceed 15 volts, because that's a safety concern. We're also looking for areas where a one centimeter squared holiday would have more than whatever threshold we say it is, 20 amps per meter squared, or we can maybe pick a higher threshold, but 20 tends to be the number here in the US that we default to, because that's where corrosion can be started. We need a lot of data to fill the model out. We need data on the HVAC transmission line. We need data on the pipeline. We need data on the soil resistivity. And we need to know where there are changes that occur. Because of these changes, these are called excitation points. Okay? So as this pipeline, especially for the steady state, the, the induced current, as you're moving along, if there's all of a sudden a change in the pipeline or the, the high voltage tower line, that becomes an inflection point or something. Often it's a, it's a, a hot spot in the system point of excitement. So we're looking for those places where things change. If the pipeline and, and the um, HVAC line run parallel for a long distance and all of a sudden it deviates, that's where you're going to probably have your problems. Okay. But that's what the model is looking for. So what kind of data are we looking for? For the HVAC line, we want to know the tower geometry. The tower geometry can change too. Okay. But how high is the tower? How long are the spans? What's the separation of the different phase conductors? Because AC is, is always a three-phase system. There's an A, B, and a C line. Do they transpose? Because every once in a while, they'll, they'll switch. They do this for um, electrical transmission purposes. They'll have a, a phase shift where they actually, you can see it, drive down, uh, look at high voltage lines. Every once in a while, you see that cross, and they'll, like this line will all of a sudden go from here to here, and this one will switch over. We want to know where those are, because they go put in the model that way. We want to know the phase conductor range. Which one's A, which one's B, and which one's C? We want to know the conductor heights, the conductor separation distance, shield wires. Often they'll put a shield wire. Shield wire basically is um, helps in fault conditions. Okay, if there's a fault, some of the faults instead of dumping into the earth will go along that shield wire. Okay, there's optical shield wires. There's different types of shield wire construction. We want to know the current loading. What's the average current flowing through that line? What's the peak or maximum current that can be expected to flow through that line? Is there an anticipation that they're going to increase the rating of that line down the in the future? Okay, a lot of these lines they know that okay for now we're doing this, but in two years there's going to be a big housing development put over here, and we're going to have an increased load, and they're going to run more electrical current through there. And we want to know the fault information, ground fault information. The power companies don't like to give you this data sometimes. Collecting this data sometimes is a matter of combination going out in the field and physically measuring taking a laser finder and actually measuring the height of the conductors and the distance between them and GPO points and all that. And sometimes we have to go to the power company and say, can you tell me what's your maximum fault conditions? What's your, the length of your maximum fault? How quickly will your, your breakers trip, trip in to, to clear the fault? Sometimes they'll give you that information. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll ask you to pay for that information. We've had pipeline clients doing AC modeling where the pipeline company goes to the, or us as their consultants are asked to go to the transmission company and they'll say, well, we'll give that information that's going to cost you $50,000 or $20,000 because we have to go look it up and we don't want to give it to you and we don't have to, so we're going to charge you for it. So getting this information can be a challenge sometimes. If we don't have this information, sometimes we'll just make assumptions. But we all know what making assumptions does when you put them into a model. Okay? So the more assumptions we make, the less valid the model becomes. We want to know pipeline characteristics. These are generally easier to get. Either they're easy to measure or the pipeline com company has pretty good data on that. You need to know the pipeline diameter or diameter. Sometimes the diameter might change. It might go from being a 16 inch pipe to a 20 inch pipe at some location. That would be an excitation point because now there's a change going on. Wall thickness and material construction. Sometimes pipelines will have, as you go along the length of a pipeline, you'll go from one type of wall to another type of wall thickness or different age of pipeline. This was put in the 50s and this was put in the 70s. Um, coating type and thickness. Coating conductance or quality. How good is the coating? Is there really old coating? In which case you probably don't have a big AC problem. Is there brand new coating, really good quality, in which case you probably have a bigger AC problem. Um, you may switch from one type of 
of uh, FBE coding to another FBE coding along the length of the pipeline. They have different stress coding values because they're different manufacturers, different type. We can go out and test coding conductance. There's some tests you can do. So if they don't know the answer to that, we can go out and test that. But that's part of the model and information. Depth of cover survey, really important. How does that pipeline <coughs> change its depth relative to um, the earth? Because pipelines aren't always two feet. Sometimes they dip down, sometimes they dip up. You know, it could be four foot depth in one location, six foot depth in another location. And we need to know the accurate GPS center line of the pipeline. So we'll go, we'll actually go, or someone will provide us that data, or we'll go and collect that data. We'll actually measure exactly where that pipeline is, the center line of it. We'll GPS it, put that all into a, a database. We'll GPS each one of the tower locations so we know exactly where those are. We'll GPS where the conductors are so we know where, where they are. All that information is put in the model. Location of all valves, casings, bonds, foreign pipeline crossings, everything to do with that pipeline, we need to collect that data and throw it into the model. And then we need to have a pretty good idea of what the solar resistivity is. And ideally, we want that at different depths. Okay, the software has the ability to look at multiple layer effects of the soil. So we will take solar resistivity readings at different depths, two foot depth, five foot depth, 10 foot depth, 100 foot depth even at multiple locations along the pipeline. And all that data can get thrown into the model. For modeling pipelines and transmission lines, some of the key features that the SES software we use offer include a multi-layer up to five layers, um, solar city modeling. Uh, some of the, the other models that are out there may only offer one or two layers. Um, we have a large conductor database to choose from, including most transmission line conductors, all copper conductors, and mitigation devices like zinc ribbon and mitigator. Uh, we have the ability to model large networks, uh, including multiple power lines and multiple pipelines in the same model and along the same corridor. Um, so again, if it's a relatively simple co-location, you may not need to do all this. Modeling is going to cost you typically anywhere from a very simple modeling job, might be $20,000, um, to well over $100,000 for a large modeling job. There's a lot of data collection required, a lot of modeling effort required. Um, so, in some cases, it may be simpler just to put $10,000 worth of grounding in and say, I'm going to over-design it because it's just not worth the effort to go model it. Other cases, modeling is an absolute necessity. Um, the AC modeling program we have is, has the ability to model transformers, um, insulators, substations, all these electrical um, transmission line devices and, and, and systems that get input in there. We can model different phasing, pipe diameters, and coating type configurations in one model, uh, solid state decoupler sizing. There's a CAD tool that allow for us to plot this out in 3D. Um, there's an AC corrosion output. We do fault modeling. Um, and we do um, a variety of, of, of data outputs coming from this. And here's an example of a model where you've got um, multiple High voltage transmission lines, and you've got a pipeline going from um, one location out to this terminal. And you can see we have to model each one of those AC lines, and we have to model the pipeline's characteristics as well. And ultimately, you come up with um, an output that's going to show you along the length of that pipeline those areas where you have concerns about steady state touch potentials for a safety standpoint where it might be above 15 volts. Um, it'll also tell you what your one centimeter holiday leakage current is for AC induced corrosion. And not shown here would be default um, conditions, but this will also give you a, a, show you areas where fault currents can exceed the maximum allowable for your um, coating stress. And then, as I mentioned, there are some areas where it's just not worth the effort to go through all of the modeling. Um, if someone provides modeling, there's definitely a place for modeling. And we, we, we offer that where it's necessary. There are other places where you can look at and say, you know what, this is a really simple application. It's not worth spending $10,000, $20,000 to have a model run. We can just put a solution in that's going to be over-designed, but will effectively solve the problem. That ends the discussion on modeling. The next phase we'll talk about is mitigation. What do we do once we know where the problems are?